Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. From Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Deborah Carr in Persuasion on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Ladies and gentlemen, this is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we dramatize a classic, the novel by Jane Austen called Persuasion. Jane Austen was born in an English village a year before the Declaration of Independence. She never left England. She rarely visited London. She never married. She didn't concern herself with any of the great events of her own time, and she died at the age of 41. Yet during those few years, and in that small world of her own, she contrived to write half a dozen novels which have not only been read constantly ever since, but are judged to be among the very greatest in all literature. A strange thing, a sort of puzzle, a miracle, if you like. Anyhow, this novel, Persuasion, which was the last Jane Austen wrote, contains also one of her most delightful heroines. So to play that part tonight, we are proud to welcome back to our playhouse that enchanting English actress, Deborah Carr. And now here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying Hallmark on the back when you select it. For words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste, that Hallmark on the back is your guide. Like the sterling on silver, it's a mark of distinction that all quickly recognize. And it tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Our star tonight, Deborah Carr, is appearing by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Lone Star, starring Clark Gable, Ava Gardner, and Broderick Crawford. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Jane Austen's Persuasion, starring Deborah Carr. Kellynch Hall in Somerset, in England a century and a quarter ago, when the writing of a book was a daring thing for a mere woman to do, lest the male of the species find out too much about that great secret, a woman's heart. The young lady there is Anne Elliot, daughter of Sir Walter Elliot, master of Kellynch Hall, and we must tell you that Miss Anne is 27, an age when women think it's not quite proper to go on dreaming. Tell me, Anne, shall I order another trunk? No, Father. I have packed all that is possible to pack. Don't look away. I know you're sad. I know you wish to cry. If it is any comfort to you, I am also sad. I also wish to weep. Oh, Father. It is my fault that we must leave Kellynch Hall, that we must rent it to some stranger. It was I who spent all our money. Not too wisely, I'm afraid. Don't blame yourself, Father. If your mother were alive, she would have directed my hand and my pocketbook with more wisdom. We men never admit that women are wise, but it's true. Then I am not a typical woman, Father, for I am very foolish. You still think about him? After eight years? Yes, Father. Today especially. For this house which I love is the second thing in my life I have had to give up. It was not foolish, child. I should not have allowed myself to be persuaded. Frederick Wentworth was not of our class in society. You must not forget your duties to your station in life as a member of the nobility. Oh, see how noble the nobility is, Father. We are packing our lives in old trunks and carting them away. 
Oh, I, I'm sorry, Father. Here, help me shut the lid. Do you have everything? No, Father. I have nothing. I take only such dull things as dresses and hats and gloves. I leave behind my childhood, my youth, my heart. dear Lady Russell, you'll find us in Bath. Father and I have taken a small cottage. With the rent from Kellynch Hall, he will be able in time to pay off his many debts. Very admirable. Your father is a man of honor. Tell me, who has rented Kellynch Hall? A retired British naval officer, an admiral. Mary? Yes. Good. A house is never taken care of properly without a lady. Any family? No, no children. Better still. A lady without a family is the best preserver of furniture in the world. Mm -hmm. What is their name? Croft, Admiral Croft and his wife. I know Mrs. Croft. So do you, Anne. I do. Before she married, her name was Wentworth. <gasps> Frederick's sister. Yes. Perhaps after eight years, he'll be coming back to this part of the country. Yes. Perhaps he will. Whom are you looking for, Anne? Your eyes keep darting about. Oh, no one, Father. It's been so long since I've attended a dance. I, I wish to see everything. Perhaps make up for a few lost years. <laughs> you are still a young, radiant woman, Anne. No, Father. I am not young. I have lost the bloom of the 19-year-old. Eight years is a long time. And... But I have one attribute of the young father. I am hopeful. My eyes and I are hopeful. And Miss Louisa Musgrove and Captain Fred Frederick Wentworth. Oh, father, hold my hand. Ah. I did not know Wentworth had risen to so high a rank in the Navy, and I did not know he was back in England. He is back. He is back. Do you suppose he'll remember me, Father? Of course he will. Anne, I feel your heart beating in the tips of your fingers. But how pale you are. I have outlived the age of blushing, Father. Anne, dear, if you care to, I'll take you home. I don't wish this to be a trial or an embarrassment oh, for you. No, Father. I have been waiting eight years for a chance to be in the same room with him. Do not deprive me of this moment. Oh. What's wrong, Anne? Oh, how young she is. The girl with him. Oh, it's rather cruel, don't you think, that men always choose girls of 19? Only a yesterday ago, you were 19, and you did not think so then. Only a yesterday ago. Good evening. Sir Walter Elliot, is it not? It's a pleasure to see you again, sir. Captain Wentworth, you remember my daughter, Anne? Captain? Miss Elliot, forgive me, I did not recognize you. May I have the honor of presenting Miss Louisa Musgrove, my fiancée? <laughs> He did not even know me. And that silly girl, blonde and vacant face, stood at his side. Oh, Anne, Anne, my dear, a sailor home from the sea is the most susceptible of men and the most easy to capture. Gold braid on his sleeve is no protection whatsoever. What a strange thing hope is. Rather a universal joke, a pleasant prelude to amuse us before a disappointment. Oh, Lady Russell... How many days and how many nights I have relived the moment when I refused him. Do, do we all do that? Rehearse in our minds all the things we should have said years and years ago. The French have an expression for it. Esprit d'escalier. 
the inspiration that comes as you are descending the steps after the door has shut. But it was I who shut the door. I deserted and disappointed him. But worse, I, I showed a weakness of character by doing so. I gave him up to oblige others. It was the effect of over-persuasion. It was weakness and timidity. In a man, you would call it cowardice. Oh, Anne, come here, dear. Sit here by me. You have no mother. I have no child. We shall be mother and daughter to each other. Oh, Lady Russell, I need a mother. <laughs> Perhaps I need a daughter. Perhaps I need a daughter. This is not a storybook. It does not write itself a happy ending. Sometimes we must help shape the story ourselves. I have been plotting. Have you? And in my storybook, you return to Kellynch Hall and as Lady Elliot. Oh, but how is that possible? Next in line to your father is your distant relative, William Elliot. I have invited him here. He is a widower. And I understand he is quite a handsome man. Lady Elliot. Mistress of Kellynch Hall, like your mother before you. You could call it home again. But, Lady Russell, I have never even met William Elliot. Do not rush the story, dear Anne. We haven't yet reached the part where it says they lived happily ever after. Thank you, Mr. Elliot, for a most pleasant visit. Oh, my dear Anne, you must not call me Mr., but William. I have known you such a short time. And I have known you all the days of my life. Indeed? How? By reputation, my dear Anne. I have been acquainted with you by character for many years. Your person, your accomplishments, and your manner. Oh, you flatter me. You are too noble and lovely a creature for the trick of modesty which only plain women use. Oh, you must not say things like that, cousin. The name of Anne Elliot has long possessed a charm over my fancy, and if I dared, I would breathe my wishes that the name might never change. I thank you, William. Ah, better. I shall see you tomorrow, my dear Anne, for the picnic by the river. It will be my pleasure, cousin William. Good night. The stars watch over you, lovely lady. Anne? Oh, Lady Russell, I am glad you're here. What's wrong, dear? I, I wish I could explain it. William is too... too polished, too smooth. I want to take each sentence he says and rumple it up. He's a gentleman. Everybody likes him. Oh, maybe that's the trouble. I wish somebody didn't like him. He's too agreeable. I think I prefer a, a frank and open-hearted person. Somebody with delight and indignation with eagerness and warmth rather than sheen. Formality can be a virtue. Oh, he seems to have memorized all his lines like a player in the theater. Be patient, then. But I have no heart to give. I lost it many years ago. Anne? Are you oh. in there, Anne? Come in, Father. Oh, tell me, child, did you meet Cousin William? Uh, yes, Father. I have no doubt you charmed him, and he charmed you, no doubt. Father, is this a conspiracy between you and Lady Russell? Not a conspiracy. Not at all. However, a romantic union with Cousin William would solve our financial problems and might even allow us to return to Kellynch Hall. I understand, Father. One thing. We are not persuading you in this matter. Uh, no, Father. You are doing this of your own free will. Yes, Father. Good. Then you have forgotten that captain, that uh, Wentworth. Yes, Father. I have forgotten him. I have forgotten him completely.
moment, we'll return to the second act of Persuasion, starring Deborah Carr. There was a time when a young man paid as much as $25 or $30 for a valentine. Those were the days you only sent valentines to your sweetheart. And in many parts of the world, they were considered a proposal of marriage. Today, instead of sending one only to our one and only, we send valentines to most everyone we have affection for. To the dear lady down the street we wave good morning to. To the babysitter we can always depend on. To a friend far away. To anyone who has shown us a special kindness. We can even send ones as sweet and beautifully decorated as the Valentines of yesteryear, but much less expensive. Because there's a special collection of Hallmark old-fashioned Valentines to choose from. And because these are Hallmark Valentines, you can find one that says what you want to say. Just the way you want to say it with the good taste you demand of anything that bears your personal signature. That's one of the main reasons people everywhere look for Hallmark on the back of the cards they send. Why, that Hallmark on the back means you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton and the second act of Persuasion, starring Deborah Carr. <laughs> As Jane Austen herself observed, this was an age of pride and of prejudice, of sense and sensibility. But more than anything, it was an age of persuasion, when young ladies were gently but firmly persuaded to make a proper match, to marry within the confines of their own social set. Such a lady was Anne Elliot. Well, now, there they are, Anne and her companions, on a stony riverbank, all ready to enjoy a picnic in 19th century England. Are you enjoying yourself, oh. my dear Anne? Oh, yes, William. The air, the sunshine, the river, the young people. Uh, you are one of them. Uh, no, William. No, I'm not. Your eyes are on the young blonde girl. She is hardly typical. Such energy, such spirit. I wonder, watching Miss Louisa, if I were so daring at 19, so... So foolish? I hardly think so. Just listen to her. Oh, oh Freddie, Weddy, this is such fun. I'm glad you're pleased with the picnic, Louisa. Oh, look at this big, silly old rock. I want to climb to the very top of it. Take my hand, Freddy. Uh, yes, Louisa. Now I will jump off this rocky rocky, and my Freddie Weddy can catch me in his big, strong arms. Uh, no, Louisa, I don't think that's wise. You might hurt yourself. Oh, folks, here I come. One, two, Louisa, no. <laughs> Louisa! Oh, good heavens! Help! Someone help me. She's hit herself on the head. She's dead. She's certainly dead. No, not dead. What should we do? What should we do? A doctor is needed here. William, there is a surgeon on the high road. Run there immediately and fetch him. Uh, yes, sir. Captain Wentworth, in my bag there are smelling salts. Hand them to me, please. Uh, yes. There now, my dear. You're going to be all right. You've just had a nasty bump on your head. Oh, how could you have missed his arms? You foolish child. <laughs> You are quite a heroine, Anne. The whole town is talking about your calm and your efficiency when that poor child was hurt at the picnic. I did nothing, Lady Russell. I'm glad Louisa is well and out of danger. For his sake, for he loves her. Are you certain of that? He's going to marry her. Do you really think so? Oh, he hovers about her as if she were a wounded bird. That's exactly what Louisa is. A bird. All flutter. I could not have planned anything more climactic, more character-revealing than that little accident. Fate moved in and helped give my plot an additional turning. Mm, your plot, indeed. Your plot for me to marry William. I can never marry him. I know that now. I never intended that you should. What? Every story must have conflict, intrigue, surprise, and an unexpected finish. I don't understand what you mean, Lady Russell. I have observed the 
oldest trick known to women. Trick? Don't you know that a man never wants to be the only one who is after a woman? He must always win over some other man. He must always emerge superior, victorious, triumphant. It's very simple. Any caveman could have told you that. So you invited William here simply to make Frederick jealous. Oh, jealous is a harsh word. Let us say, aware. I thank you, Lady Russell, but you are wrong. Frederick has not even spoken to me. He will. If he doesn't, he is a very foolish young man. And there is still a choice left to you. Second best, to be sure. But your second love goes with it. Challenge Hall. Let us put aside this entire business. Please, Lady Russell, I... I, I do not like to play tricks. My dear child, I have done all the trickery. Yes? Come in. Uh, begging your pardon, Lady Russell, uh, there's a gentleman who is asking after Miss Elliot. He says it's most urgent. Aha. Uh, his name is... We know his name, Bronson. It is Captain Frederick Wentworth. Oh. Uh, you're quite right, Lady Russell. Oh, dear. I shall leave you two alone. Show the gentleman in, Bronson. Very good, my lady. Oh, do you know, Anne, if it were fashionable for women to write novels, I think I would write one. My plot thickens so charmingly. Oh, what shall I do? What shall I say? Now, you don't need a novelist to tell you that. Ta-ta. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Miss Elliot. Uh, Anne. It is a pleasure to see you again, Captain Wentworth. I've come to thank you. How calm and capable you were at the picnic. How admirable. I did nothing. You did a great deal. How strange it seems to talk to you again. Uh, it has been eight years. You remember then? I thought you had forgotten. No, Captain Wentworth. I have not forgotten. But I have always heard and read that women forget so easily. Inconstant as the wind, the poet says. Oh, then I must defend not only myself, but all of womankind. We do not forget you as soon as you forget us. We live at home, quiet, confined, with our feelings as our companions. But you men have professions and pursuits to take you out into the busy world, to help you forget. If you speak up for womankind, I must defend mankind. As our bodies are stronger, so are men's feelings. Then I shall continue the analogy. Your feelings may be the stronger, but ours are the more tender. Songs, poems, proverbs, they all talk of woman's fickleness. And all written by men, so please, no arguments from books. I will not allow books to prove anything. <laughs> Anne. Anne, I know how much you love Kellynch Hall. My sister and brother-in-law have rented it, but only temporarily. Someday, Sir William Elliot and his wife will move in. I can see how and why it would be your wish to return there. I have visited my sister. I have walked through the corridors, hearing the echoes of your footsteps. Have you? I have looked out of the windows and said... Here is where Anne watched the birth of springtime. Here is where Anne watched sunrise and sunset and starlight. You are very understanding, Captain Wentworth. I must tell you about a friend of mine. She also once lived in a house much like Kellynch Hall. And she has told me her most secret thoughts. She was in love once, long ago. And she has told me that if she could correct a mistake she made those many years ago, oh, how easy it would be to give up marble halls, my friend said. How easy to build your own house out of your own happiness. The, the, these are things my friend has told me. Your friend interests me very much. Tell me, is she the kind of a girl who would never call a man named Frederick Freddy Weddy? Oh, never. And is your friend a woman and not a child? 
she has told me that often she feels like too much of a woman. Mm, one more question about this friend of yours, because she fascinates me. Yes. Is your friend's name Miss Anne Elliot? How in the world do men at sea learn so much about the secrets in a woman's heart? Will you marry me, Miss Anne? Oh, Captain Wentworth. Oh, Frederick, you have persuaded me. James Hilton will return in a moment. Teach them to do something with their hands. Teach them to do something for others. These are familiar words of advice that any parent recognizes immediately. Tonight I have a suggestion about a way you can combine these two bits of wisdom and do it in a way all children love. Let them make their own valentines. It's easy to do with the hallmark make your own valentine kit. For only one dollar, there are the makings of 16 valentines, big red hearts, lacy white panels, and special cut-out designs of appealing little animals dear to the hearts of all children. Even tiny fingers have an easy time putting these hallmark valentines together. And how the children do enjoy giving their own handiwork come Valentine's Day. In addition to the one dollar box, the, the box, there are hallmark make-your-own valentine packages for as little as 50 cents. So ask for the Hallmark Make Your Own Valentine kits tomorrow. You'll know them by that identifying Hallmark on the cover of the box or the top of the package. It's that same symbol of quality you always look for on the back of a card when you care enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. We always enjoy your visits to our Hallmark Playhouse, Deborah, and never more than tonight. Thank you for a delightful performance. I'm so glad you liked it, Mr. Hilton. I've always liked Jane Austen's novels, and so I was very happy when you asked me to play the role of Anne tonight. And since the last time you were here, I understand there's a beautiful new baby at your house, Deborah. Mm -hmm. And her name is Anne, too. How is Francesca Anne? As, as charming as her mother? Oh, much more so. She has the whole family under her thumb already. <laughs> I was just thinking when Frank Goss told about the Hallmark Make Your Own Valentine kiss how both of my girls will enjoy making their own Hallmark Valentines when they get a little older. It's such a nice way to teach children thoughtfulness, isn't it? Yes, I think it is, Deborah. And now I'd like to tell you about the story we're going to have on Hallmark Playhouse next week. Oh, next Thursday. That is Valentine's Day, yes. isn't it? I'll bet you're going to have a special story for that day, a love story. Yes, indeed, and a love story from real life. We shall dramatize the story of Clara and Robert Schumann. And as our star, we shall have one of Hollywood's favorite actresses, Joan Fontaine. And now may I remind you of what we owe to the schools of our country. Better schools will build a stronger America. And because the need for elementary school teachers is great, so the need for your active support of schools is also great. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our story tonight was dramatized by Lawrence and Lee. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. The role of Captain Frederick tonight was played by Whitfield Connor and Jeanette Nolan was Lady Russell. Others in our cast were Lorene Tuttle, Ted Osborne, and Ben Wright. You are invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame every Sunday afternoon on television. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time 
when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Joan Fontaine in the story of Clara and Robert Schumann. And the week following, Herbert E. Stover's Powder Mission, starring Barry Sullivan. And the week after that, Harriet Fitz Ryan's Mother of the Groom on the Hallmark Playhouse. Radio this is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.